this big, crazy party. I want to take a minute, like I did with the kids, to just review the art, right? So it was a really important, basically an exquisitely decorated box, a container, that held these precious artifacts from the ancestors, uh, these tablets that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. And this art was also thought to be very um, powerful. It was thought that God's power rested on this object and that God's presence on earth was in this place, wherever that art was. And it was full of this sacred energy, but it was also like very terrifying, right? Uh, does anybody remember the appearance of this uh, mystical art in the Raiders of the Lost Ark. You may remember that in the Anna Jones stands here. Um, you might remember the scene where the Nazis have trapped down the Ark of the Covenant and they open it and this energy comes out and burns holes in their stomachs and then melts their faces off and then their bodies explode in the fire of the same um, That's not really biblical. Um, <laughs> There's actually a story that was cut out of the reading last week. You gotta watch out, like when you see a reading and then there's like it skips some verses. That's like the juicy, awkward part. And if I want to go home and take a look at it. Um, so this part that was cut out from the reading last week was, um, you know, the people were carrying the ark to Jerusalem, the city that David had just conquered, and they and they put the ark. The ark was probably pretty heavy. They put it on this cart, and it, the cart was being pulled by oxen. And, and, you know, David and all the people, they were just going to town. They were so happy. They were dancing around the ark and singing and playing their tambourines, as people do, I guess, when they're happy. And it was this great celebration, full of victory and this hope for peace and prosperity. And the ark is just riding along, being pulled by these oxen, and the ride gets a little bumpy as I suppose cart rides pulled by oxen might get, I don't know. Um, and this guy, Uza, who's driving the cart, he reaches out just to study it because it seemed like it was falling. And he touches the ark, and then suddenly he's just zapped at it. And that situation kind of put a damper on the party's spirit, I think. Uh, you can imagine that people suddenly hear a zap or sizzle or whatever noise would accompany God over it is that, you know, their jaws fall, and some of them probably start screaming and running away, and David puts down his tambourine and kind of looks at this arc thing and is like, um, what is this thing again? Uh, and we're taking this thing into my, into my city. And seeing how this thing just like murdered one of his employees uh, out of nowhere, David starts having some second thoughts about taking this arc into his big city. And instead of it taking it into Jerusalem, he actually takes the ark over to this random guy's house, this guy named Obed Edom. And, and David knocks on the door, and in this ancient account of probably the first um, game of hot potato, he, he just kind of says, hey, I brought you this thing, hope you can take care of it for me, thanks, hi. And he just runs off to Jerusalem without the ark. But after a few months, I think it's three months, uh, David hears, you know, there haven't been any more zappings from the ark, and instead the ark has actually blessed the house of Obed-Edom. And so David decides, you know, I think I want that ark back. Yeah, no, I'm going to change my mind and go get that, get that ark back. And he laces up his dancing shoes and picks up his tambourine, and he leads the people in uh, finishing this joyful parade of bringing the ark into Jerusalem. So he missed a lot of those missing verses, right? Um, so, he, so he brings the ark into Jerusalem, and then David places the ark in this special tent. And the ark has kind of lived in these special tents since the time of Moses, since the time it was uh, constructed. And then David starts to get settled there in Jerusalem, and I 
actually this nearby king, King Kiwa of Tyre, decides that, oh, this David is doing pretty well with all his military conquests. And uh, King Kiwa wants to get on the good side of this up and coming king, right? So, so he decides that he'd, he'd be uh, well to give David a welcome to the neighborhood present. Now I'll just share when I moved here about a month ago. My district superintendent, who's kind of my, my boss, uh, he sent, it was very sweet, he sent someone to deliver to me a couple of potted plants as a welcome to the neighborhood present, um, which was very cool. So that is one way to welcome someone to the neighborhood. King Hiram of Tyre had a different welcome to the neighborhood present in mind. Um, he actually sent people to haul huge amounts of cedar wood from Tyre, which is in Lebanon, all the way down to Jerusalem, and then had those people build a custom-made house for David out of these amazing Lebanese cedars. Now, I'm not knocking, you know, house plants. That's a very welcoming gift, but, but a custom-built cedar house, that is classic. So, David, David, imposter syndrome um, that many of those of us who come from the margins feel when we get to sit at the tables of power and we feel like we don't deserve to be there. Maybe he's feeling like he doesn't really deserve to be there and he needs to do some big grand gesture to earn his place at the table of kings. Or maybe David, who just gained a lot through these military victories, just wants to consolidate his power by building a great religious monument. We don't know. Uh, but for whatever reason, David tells his friend Nathan, who's also a prophet and kind of an advisor to David, you know, he tells Nathan, you know, I'm thinking about maybe building a house for God rather than this nice house. And Nathan, you know, showing his great skills as a thoughtful and critical advisor, basically said, you do you, David. That's not what I'm going to do. Whatever. But like a certain president after a press conference, Nathan gets a talking to that night about his less than thoughtful comments, and the next day has to reverse his statement. So that night, God talks to Nathan about David's big ideas uh, to build a house for the Ark of God. And this, evidently, this idea strikes a chord with God because God seems pretty offended by it. He, he, God is pretty uh, verbose in response to this idea. And God says, and this is my paraphrase, but basically, you know, Nathan, you need to go back and tell David, start this off with, thus saith Yahweh the omnipotent. Um, but say, David, isn't that nice that you want to build me you know, and I, I'm pretty sure that the intention was for this to come with a very condescending cap on David's cute little head. You know, isn't that nice? You want to build me a house. It's funny that I, I just can't remember ever asking you to build me a house. Just because it doesn't seem to be clear to everyone here, I don't actually need people to build me a house because I am the one who builds houses? I know your new friend, King Hiram, you built you a little something there. But did you even realize that I'm building you a house? An even greater house. I built 
you up from being this little kid shepherd into being the king of the Israelites. I am building you a house. I am building you a royal dynasty. You don't just decide to build me. Just to be clear, this is not about you. It's not about your fame or your glory. It's not about your guilt or your shame or your unnecessary efforts to prove yourself worthy of whatever. This story is not about you. God says, this story is about me and about all of my children. Your story might be big to you, David, but your story is just one tiny chapter in a much bigger story that includes your ancestors, who, by the way, I asked to build me my tent, and I really like it, but that story also includes the people who are coming after you, and guess what? They're going to build me a house. Other people whom you have never even met, who you can't even are going to do great things in this story because, and just to reiterate, this story is not about you. You have a role to play, but you will never really know what that role is. Your job is to be faithful, to listen to my voice in your life and to trust me that I am doing something with your days. So sit down for a minute and show. You don't have to build every house, David. I got this. Thus saith Yahweh, the humbled. So the Hebrew text doesn't translate directly to I got this. Um, that is all kind of my paraphrase of God's words. You can read a uh, more literal, tra literal translation in your Bibles this afternoon, but that's that is how I read God's long message that is to be passed on to David. And those words really resonate with me. Because I don't know about you, but I feel like I am always trying to build God a house. I'm always trying to build things for God or for other people or for my own legacy and ego. something I think about a lot, is wondering what is the point of being active in a religious community? Uh, why should I be active in a religious community when I got my book club and my Zumba class and my local chapter of Democratic Socialists of America? If you're wondering what religious community can add to a life, this is one thing. together as a religious community, we are reminding one another that we are part of a larger story. That this suffering that we are experiencing is something that God has conquered before. And even if we don't see it in our lifetime, even if our children do not see the victory, God is on the way to being glorified when that suffering will end. We are part of a larger story, and whatever thing that feels like the most 
from the zoom out perspective of the long story. We are part of the larger story, God's story. And I'm not the hero of that story, so the salvation of that loved one, the sobriety, the safety of that child or partner or parent is not my project to control. I can do my best, but in the end, I've got to let go and know that God's got this. That reminder of a, of a larger, longer story is just one thing. That meeting together in a religious community has got to offer our lives. This week, as I thought about the long story, I found myself thinking about my Chinese grandmother, whose Buddhist prayer blanket I shared with the children today. And as I said, I know almost, I know almost nothing of this woman, and she knows exactly nothing about me. She's no longer with us, and she never knew that I existed. My father was in the Chinese Navy when Mao took China, and he fled to Taiwan with the Chinese government when he was 19. And he never got to see or legally communicate with his mother ever again. So she died before I was born, and my dad, you know, he didn't want to burden me with uh, the sad stories of his life, so he didn't tell me any of them. The only story I really know about my grandmother is that she refused to renounce her son, my father, even though he'd been on the losing side of the war. And for that sin, Chinese police beat her almost to death during the Cultural Revolution. And so I think about her strength and her pain and her rebellious resistance a lot. You know, never knew her. But most of what I know about my grandmother was not taught to me in stories. It was taught to me through my father's meditation practice. My dad had this chair in the living room, and he would sit in it for several hours every day with back straight and eyes closed, just breathing in and out, in and out, which sounds you know, admirable, unless it's occurring in a chair in a hotel courtyard and visible to everyone on my high school gymnastics team. When I was growing up, Crazy. He would awkwardly sit me down and try to teach me these weird things from how to make sure my bowel movements were regular to how to include black sesame seeds in my diet to keep my hair from growing gray. I gotta say, he actually had pretty black hair through his 80s, so it's a little tip. But he also taught me things that he learned from my grandmother. He would demonstrate for me the correct technique for giving oneself a facial massage, and he would talk me through this long breathing meditation, in and out. I thought he was out of his mind. My dad died just a few days after I found out I was pregnant, and the saddest thing for me was that I uh, never got to tell him that he was a grandpa. So I started off my pregnancy with this deep grief. But soon after my dad's funeral, I started doing prenatal yoga. And every week, I would sit on the floor with these other pregnant women. And I would prepare with them for childbirth by breathing in and out. And there were some weeks when our teacher would lead us in facial massage, and we would rub our temples and our cheeks and our jaws, just like my dad used to demonstrate for me while I slouched on the couch rolling my eyes. And on those days in yoga class when I would put my hand on my stomach and prepare my breath for the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, I could feel my dad breathing with me the breaths that his mother, my grandmother, And it was that breathing just passed down from my daughter's ancestors 
that brought her into the world and that made her just one part in a very long story. My grandmother and my father never knew the arc of that story. They didn't know the part that they played or how their suffering would one day be redeemed. They didn't know even the characters that would come after them. My grandmother never knew how her breath practice would one day birth a great grandchild who is awesome and full of joy. I wonder if there might be someone in this place today, someone besides me, who is feeling overwhelmed by the things in life which you cannot control. There may be someone in this place today who is feeling overwhelmed by the pressure to be the hero, the savior in your own life and in your relationships and family and in the world. This is God's message for you today, delivered through the prophet Nathan. God is doing something with your life. But remember that you are a part of a story that is much bigger than you. A story that is much longer than the span of your life. And that story is not one that you can control or that you need to control. God is working and creating that long narrative. And you have a role to play in it, but you may never really know what that role is. Your job is just to be faithful. to listen to God's voice in your life, and to trust, to have faith that God is doing something with your days. So beloved, rest, sit, be still, breathe in and out. You don't have to build every house. That's God's. Thanks to God.